Hello and welcome to Greece Travel Guide. Today's video is something a little different to our normal content. In September 2020, I was fortunate enough to visit Greece for just under three weeks despite the travel disruptions caused by COVID-19. Instead of producing separate island guides for each of the destinations I visited, this video is a summary of my entire trip in more of a vlog or journal style, containing some hopefully useful insights into the islands I visited and the things I did in each location. It's quite long, so you'll find timestamps in the description below if you want to skip ahead. My trip began with an early morning Ryanair flight from Stansted. As I expected, the coronavirus pandemic meant the airport was exceptionally quiet. I was through security in minutes and waiting for my flight at the boarding gate. On arrival in Athens, I collected my bag and went straight through to the departure lounge for my connecting flight. I spent a couple of hours in a nice executive lounge courtesy of my Sky Express ticket, enjoying some free drinks and snacks while watching the planes coming and going. My first stop is the Cycladic island of Milos. I've never been before and was excited to visit as it's quite a popular destination. After a short 35 minute flight, we had touched down at the very small airport. I had pre-booked a taxi transfer via my accommodation, Venus de Milo Studios, situated in the main port town of Adamus. The journey took less than 10 minutes. After a brief walk to explore the local area, I settled on a harbour front taverna for the first of many Greek meals, then returned to my room for an early night after a long day of travelling. I was relieved to have made it though, and excited for the days ahead. Although I had several activities planned during my time on Milos, my first full day was pretty chilled out. After a delicious breakfast at a cafe called Agaliki, I set out for Papakinu Beach for a day of sunbathing and relaxation. It's a fantastic sandy beach just 10 minutes walk from Adamus. The sea is calm, shallow and, in September at least, pleasantly warm. Later on, I spent some time using my drone to get a different perspective on Adamus and the surrounding area. On the way to dinner, I stopped at a rental shop and arranged to hire a quad bike for a couple of days so I could explore the rest of the island. Before leaving the UK, I had pre-booked a full day sailing tour on a boat called Oniro. This turned out to be one of the best experiences of my entire trip and I can't recommend it highly enough. We departed Adamus at 8.45 and returned at 6.30pm. During this time, myself and the 13 other passengers were treated to a superb guided tour, starting north past the fishing villages of Shinopi and Klima, then across the bay and around the western coastline. The trip was paced incredibly well and included breakfast, lunch and a late afternoon barbecue, with generous quantities of coffee, juices, wine and ouzo. We stopped several times to explore caves and to swim and relax in some beautiful bays. Elias the skipper is a wonderful host and although I don't usually take organised excursions, I'm so glad I did this one. I had planned to explore the western side of Milos on my first day with the quad bike, but I'd caught the sun quite badly on yesterday's boat trip, so I kept to the eastern side instead, in case I started to feel unwell and needed to return to my room. After fueling up the bike, I set off northwest towards Plaka, the capital of Milos. Its hilltop location offers stunning panoramic views across the island, from there, I continued north to the small fishing village of Firopotamos. It was quite a windy day which created some impressive waves on the exposed north-facing beach. Next stop heading east along the coastline was Mandrakia, another pretty fishing village. On the recommendation of a German couple from the boat trip yesterday, I stopped for an early lunch here at a taverna called Medusa. The menu is quite fish heavy which will definitely appeal to some, but I went for a Greek salad with bread and tzatziki instead, washed down with some nice house white wine. The famous silvery moon-like terrain of Sarakiniko Beach was my next destination. Sadly, due to the high winds, I was unable to use my drone for fear of losing it in the sea. The strong waves were keeping people out of the water too, so it was pretty quiet compared to how I imagine it would normally be. After walking around taking photos and video, I was back on the quad bike heading for Polonia. The second most popular destination after Adamus, Polonia attracts a lot of tourists with its wide selection of accommodation and tavernas and a large main beach. I had considered staying here myself, but on reflection, I don't think it has quite as good a vibe as Adamus. It's also quite out of the way, so unless you hire a car or quad bike, getting around might be a hassle. 
With some of the afternoon remaining, I checked my map in search of another sightseeing opportunity close by. The old sulphur mine at Palirima turned out to be a longer ride than I expected, and along some pretty bumpy tracks towards the end. I wouldn't recommend attempting it by car, but on a quad bike it was pretty good fun. The journey was worth it though, as the sight of the abandoned mines is pretty unique and quite eerie, especially late in the afternoon with nobody else around. I had a brief nightmare at the prospect of my quad bike breaking down and being stuck here alone overnight, but fortunately I made it back to my accommodation in one piece. For dinner, I made it to the hillside village of Tripiti just in time to catch the sunset, and then enjoyed a delicious misaka at a highly rated taverna called Aginas. Exploration of Western Milos saw me heading around the bay back past the airport. After a brief stop at Akiva de Limni Beach, I took the road south until I reached Sagrado. This beach is in a small cove, accessible only via a narrow crevice in the cliff face, with a rope anchored into the ground for assistance. From Sagrado, it's a short walk to the much larger and nicer beach of Firiplaca, which is definitely worth a visit if you're a sun worshipper like me. Sadly though, I didn't have time to hang around as my main destination was still some distance away. The entire western half of Milos is largely uninhabited. As a result, the road network is limited to bumpy dirt tracks and most car hire companies will not allow you to bring vehicles here. This was one of the main reasons I chose a quad bike and it's definitely the way to go if you want the freedom to explore all of the island. The Monastery of St John Sideranos is located towards the southwestern corner of the island and took about 40 minutes from Firiplaca. Although not open to the public, it's an impressively large site given its remoteness, and the nearby beach of Agios Yanis offered a refreshing dip after the hot journey. After a snack lunch in the shade of the monastery wall, I continued north to a series of beaches along the western coastline, Amu Daraki, Silent Beach and Triades none of which will offer the same appeal as Firiplaca unless you really like escaping from the crowds. With some of the afternoon remaining, I found myself back at Papakinu Beach for some bonus sunbathing, then enjoyed another good evening meal at a local taverna. Day 6 saw me moving on from Milos to my next destination. I've had a great time here though and look forward to returning in the future. My next stop was the neighbouring island of Sifnos. Though somewhat of an unknown quantity compared to Milos, I booked six nights here after research online suggested it's a hidden gem. The ferry crossing took less than 45 minutes. As I disembarked in the port town of Camares, I had a good feeling I was going to enjoy it here. The harbour town is much smaller than Adamus, but has a nice friendly atmosphere and the main town beach looks fantastic. My accommodation in Camares was the Hotel Camari, located on the main road a short walk back from the beach and selection of shops and tavernas. After checking into my room, I headed straight back out to get my first proper look at the beach, where I would no doubt be spending countless hours sunbathing over the next few days. I chose to spend my first full day on Sifnos relaxing at the beach, much as I had on Milos. It's a great way to ease into life on a new island, and my trips are about relaxation as well as exploration. On my way back from breakfast at Café Stavros, I stopped at a rental shop to arrange another quad bike for the following two days so I could get out and explore the island. The remainder of the day was spent with a blissful mixture of sunbathing and swimming. This has to be one of my new favourite beaches in Greece. The water is so clear and shallow way out into the bay, while the beach is soft golden sand and has a fantastic sense of openness with no buildings close by. Even if the rest of the island turned out to be a disappointment, I think I'd be perfectly happy in Camares, and knew I had found a destination I would be eager to return to in the future. Armed with the quad bike, I headed across the island, through the capital Apollonia, to the eastern coastline where you'll find the Church of the Seven Martyrs. Once again it was too windy for the drone, but I did have a go at some vlogging instead. So we're currently at the Church of the Seven Martyrs on Sifnos. In case you can't tell it's pretty windy. I'm currently hiding around the sheltered side but let's take a walk around the other side and uh, probably won't be able to hear me even though I've got the mic on. I'm in the shade now but also full in the wind. Oh. Don't know if you'll be able to hear me talking at all but it is exceptionally windy around here. As you might be able to see by the waves down there. 
let's go behind, back around the other side, where it's sunny and not so windy. Whew. That was quite an experience, hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> Moving on, I headed to the very north of the island to a small fishing village called Chironisos, where I enjoyed a brief swim and a small beer in the only taverna around. Heading south along the western coastline, it took a lot of effort to reach my next stop at Vruladir, which turned out to be something of a disappointment. The beach is very coarse shingle with a small array of sunbeds and a single taverna, it's probably best avoided. With limited options for lunch on the road, I went back to Camares for a few hours before heading out again later in the afternoon. With several hours of sunlight remaining, I decided to head to Vathi, the last beach resort on the western side of the island. My route took me past the hilltop church of Agios Andreas, so I made a quick detour and was rewarded with some excellent panoramic views of the southern side of the island. Vathi itself is quite a small upmarket resort with one large hotel and a few smaller studios and apartments, plus a selection of cafes and tavernas. It boasts a wide sandy beach and is popular with tourists seeking a more secluded and relaxed destination. I only had the southeast of the island left to explore on my second day with the quad bike. Faros is another small fishing village in a sheltered bay with a compact sandy beach and a pleasant atmosphere. It's about 20 minutes ride from Camares or 10 from Apollonia. The main road is surprisingly good and indicates the popularity of resorts on this side of the island. Moving southwest along the coastline, the monastery of Chrysopagi is hard to miss, sat atop a small rocky peninsula overlooking the nearby beach of Apokofto. Established in the 16th century, it's well worth a visit for its stunning, if slightly windy, views of the surrounding area. I stopped for a drink and rest at the Chrysopagi Taverna, situated at the southern end of Apokofto Beach, before getting back on the quad bike and heading to my next destination. Platyalos is the main tourist resort on Sifnos. Though not large by other island standards, its two kilometres of sandy beach is lined with tavernas, cafes and small studios and apartments. Some of the restaurants are widely famed for their cuisine. Apparently Tom Hanks has been known to frequent the Omega 3 fish bar. While I'm no celebrity, I did enjoy one of the best, and yes, most expensive, meals of my trip at the Lost Bay Beach Bar, so I can't dispute the quality of the food on offer here. That said, in my opinion the beach is a poor competitor to Comares. Much of the shoreline is a narrow strip of sand backed closely by buildings which gives it a slightly claustrophobic feel. There are also several areas where large rocky patches exist in the water close to shore, requiring careful footwork to get safely in and out of the sea. None of this should put you off staying here though, but I have no regrets at choosing Camares as my base instead. After spending a few more hours back on Camares beach, I had one final outing planned for the quad bike a sunset visit to the church of Agios Simeon. Perched high above Camares on the hillside to the north of the village, the church offers spectacular views east towards Apollonia, northwest to the neighbouring island of Seraphos, and, perhaps best of all, an amazing vantage point over Camares itself. This view is truly stunning and one of the highlights of my time on Sifnos. I spent a good while perched atop the church wall, looking out across the bay and quietly reflecting on life. If you visit the island, then I highly recommend making Agios Simeon part of your itinerary, especially late in the afternoon. In case you don't visit, here's a time lapse I recorded of the sun as it begins to set over Camares. My last two full days on Sifnos were spent in Camares, sunbathing and relaxing during the day and enjoying some great meals in the evening. The resort has two excellent Italian restaurants, Cameron and De Claudio, that are definitely worth a visit. With no transportation and nowhere left on the island I wanted to see, I was happy to stay local and make the most of the beach. 
The remaining islands on my trip will all be much shorter stops, so this was my last opportunity to really take it easy. Sifnos has quickly become one of my favourite Greek islands, with its combination of great beaches, excellent food and generally peaceful and relaxing atmosphere. I'm already looking forward to a return trip in the future. Next on my itinerary is the neighbouring island of Seraphos, apparently a very quiet island with relatively low tourist numbers. I played it safe and booked two nights here just to get a feel for it and see if the island might be worth a longer stay in the future. My late afternoon ferry saw me arriving in the port town of Levadi around 5pm. From there it was a short walk to my next hotel, Abati, though I hadn't anticipated it would be on such a steep hill. My room was lovely though, probably the nicest of my entire trip. With limited time on the island, I managed to negotiate hiring a car from mid-morning until my ferry leaves late tomorrow afternoon for the cost of a single day's rental. I began my exploration by heading south from Levadi, stopping first at Vagia Beach before heading on to the larger beach at Ganima. Both are nice wide stretches of soft sand and would be worth checking out if you visit the island. My final beach stop on the south coast was at Megalo Levadi. This is a smaller and less sandy beach, but does have a couple of decent tavernas where I enjoyed probably the freshest Greek salad I've ever eaten. Access to the western coastline is pretty limited, and there's not much to see, so I headed inland across the island to the capital instead. Arriving at Hora from the west, I stopped the car to capture some video of the very pretty Cycladic village perched high on top of the hillside. After checking out of my hotel in the morning, I had most of the day with the car to finish exploring Seraphos. Heading north from Levadi, my first stop was Siliamos, a small sandy beach just 10 minutes from the port. From there, I continued to the top of the island to another beach called Platyalos, set in a small bay about 3 kilometers off the main road. So as you can see, we've made it down to Platyalos beach. A little bit of an effort in the car, but the uh, road's actually not as bad as you might think. And there is the beach behind, it's very quiet here. Only a few people sunbathing. It was not surprising because there are easier places to get to to sunbathe, but it's uh, quite pretty and uh, certainly out of the way, if that's what you're looking for. So we're a little bit further west now of Platyalos Beach, and we're just outside Moni Taxiarchon, that's how you say it, which is a monastery that looks rather like a prison uh, on the north coast of Serifos. So I'm going to have a wander around and take some pictures. There's also a pretty little church here. So I'm going to check that out now and uh, see what we think. Here we are at uh, probably the last beach for today. This is uh, Sikinos on the northwestern coast. Another one that's quite out of the way, about three kilometers off the main road. Um, not too bad a road down to the beach, a little bit steep, but not too bumpy. And the beach itself is okay, quite shingly, but very long and pretty wide. If I'm being honest, I haven't really taken to Seraphos at all. Maybe the very low tourist numbers, partly due to COVID-19 I'm sure, have stolen the atmosphere you might normally find here. But aside from the pretty horror, the beaches are nothing special and I found the island a bit lacking in good dining options. Perhaps I'm being harsh after only two nights here, but I certainly wouldn't choose it over Sifnos or Milos, and I don't think I'll be heading back anytime soon. The penultimate island of my trip was Syros, where I arrived late evening on an indirect ferry via Paros. My accommodation, Acteon Hotel, was just a short walk from the ferry port and offered great views from my first floor window overlooking Amopoli Harbour. This leg of my trip didn't quite go to plan. I should have been meeting a friend on Syros, but he was unable to get here due to travel restrictions caused by the pandemic. As a result, I ended up cutting my stay down from three nights to two so that I could meet him a day earlier on my final island. I spent the morning exploring parts of Emopoli, 
heading north from my hotel to the Church of Agios Nicolaias, then back past the Apollon Theatre and onto Miauli Square. It was quite a contrast being around so many people and in a fairly big town compared with how quiet Serifos had been. Although I would like to visit Syros again, I'm much more comfortable on quieter islands and was already looking forward to moving on the next day. After a brief trip to Galissa Beach in the afternoon, I returned to the capital for an evening meal, then back to my hotel for an early night. The final leg of my journey saw me arriving on Andros after a quick stop on Tinos to switch ferries. My friend had arrived the day before and was waiting to pick me up in the port town of Gavrio, where I would be staying for my first night at the Austria Hotel. In the evening we enjoyed a great meal at Pizza Memories, a favourite taverna discovered on a previous trip a few years ago. The weather started to turn cloudy with patches of rain over the last few days of my journey, but we managed to get out for several hikes around Andros, the best of which was from Ormos Corthiu, heading north to the ruins of a castle called Fana Remeni, and finishing in Andros town. Overall it's been a fantastic trip, and I felt lucky to be able to visit Greece at a time when many people were unable to do so. The highlight has to be Sifnos, partly because I had no idea what to expect before I arrived and it was such a fantastic experience. As our ferry arrived to transport us back to Rafina for our flight home via Athens, I took with me lots of great memories of another Greek holiday and plenty of inspiration for my next trip. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you want to find out more about this or any of our previous Greek experiences, please visit our website at www.greecetravelguide.co.uk where you'll also find lots of tips and useful information about visiting Greece.